my name is Francis. So that's me. And then um, I think uh, I, I should tell you a little bit about myself. So I am a designer and also media artist. I come from a background of computer science and graphic design. And then um, I did a two years research at the MIT Media Lab doing stuff related to uh, social networks and visualizations. And then right now I am in Shanghai uh, working as a creative technologist at an advertising agency called Wyden and Kennedy. So today I'm going to show uh, people at my office always treat me as a creative technology instead of creative technologist. Anyway, um, today the topic is about coping with the digital world. This is actually about how to find a way to get inspiration from digital or technologies. I'm just going to show you some of my works as well as some examples that I think that will trigger you to create interesting digital world. So first I would like to start by um, telling you some examples of the existing internet or the online world. So uh, what I'm going to say is we are actually increasingly engaged in the online digital world. I think everybody are using social networks like Facebook in Russia. And then uh, a lot of people just use the internet to find a job, to find a lover, or to some extreme. You can make condolences to your past friends through these kind of services. Actually, this virtual funeral are kind of um, encouraged by Chinese government because it can actually um, lead to less traffic on the on our day for the funeral. And then uh, you can also do social networking for your dogs, not just for us, but also for your pets. And then. From that, you can lead to the social networking of you or maybe the, the other owner of the pet. So you can do all those random stuff on the internet. And then, um, if you are complaining about there are too much female nudity, what you can do is go to this website that I created, um, I think, six years ago. It's about sending out a lot of naked men so that it could balance these kind of inequalities on the internet world. So this is a demo video of the page. So basically, it is a, um, an online tool for you to send out e-cards. So in, I think in 2002, e-cards are still very uh, popular. So on it, you can see 100 naked men that you can use to send your your messages to your friends. So basically there is a, a, a editor, a nude man editor for you to make your own stories. So from that, it's kind of like Flash. If you know any kind of video editing tools that is uh, working in a similar fashion, but uh, not anything else but nude man that you can control. So by that, you can send your friends uh, any kind of narratives, stories, or messages by using them. So that my, I think my, my goal is to try to balance that kind of in inequality out on the internet. And I think this is this website is still up. If you are interested, you can go and send your own email. All right. So what I want to say is the internet is um, random and chaotic. Basically, it is inherently fabricated. The, the creator is somewhat like God because they, they would like to do whatever they want because it is, there's no limits of physical constraints, there's no rules of physics that you have to obey, right? So basically, it could be anything. They set the rules. So how are we going to deal with that? I mean, as a, as a designer, as a uh, maybe architect or maybe uh, advertising guy. So how can we make use of all these technologies and use new things? So I'm, I'm trying to share my experiences of doing that by trying to summarize it into three different ways. And I will show different examples. Some of them are mine and some of them are other people that I, I admire. 
So first point is to visualize, secondly that is to recreate, and then thirdly is to uh, integrate. So to, to visualize, what I mean is to visualize the um, underlying social patterns. So my research at the Media Lab is mainly about visualizing the social pattern on the internet. So basically we are going to process a large amount of data and then try to find something that is salient, something that is um, interesting, and then visualize them so that it could become a story that you understand. And um, as you know, we live in a, an internet across a widely mixed set of spaces, experiences, and relationships. Like, we, we are going to a concert, we, we are attending a lecture, we, uh, we are engaged in a private discussion, or we are chilling out on the beach. This is our offline experiences, but uh, they, are, they are a vast amount of information, all these experiences. And then, but in the online world, a lot of details and subtleties are actually lost. So we got a lot of things in these images, and at a glance, you know what they are doing without me actually explaining. But on the online world, this is how people discuss. This is like a Google Usenet page. So we got four different kinds of conversation. Like this one is about music. This one is about politics. This one about design. And this one is just chit chat. But they all look the same, right? It's so different from all this kind of contextual information. They are so rich, but online, is quite boring and then you you can hardly get what they are actually talking about by just looking at it so what are we going to do so we would like to get help from the visual designers to review all those social patterns we got so many things happening online public we would like to share it's like um right now it's more about um the internet is about sharing i think a lot of you would like to share things online using Twitter, using Foursquare, using Facebook, using all kinds of things that you can share information. And then we got huge amount of information online. And I think one of the things that interests me would be try to reveal some social patterns out of it. And we would like to try to make a large amount of data meaningful. So when we connect all these dots, all these meaningful dots together, it could, it could mean something. Or maybe you can you can think about it as a way to tell a story. Uh, look at uh, look at Marco Lombardi, one of my very favorite artists, who did a lot of narrative structures. Uh, he did paintings not by like drawing out things, but actually making relationships between different events. So what he called narrative structures are actually events and relationships of people. This is a drawing about the um, very famous Watergate scandal in the United States. So what he did is trying to gather a lot of information from newspapers, uh, magazines, some facts. All these circles are actually a person, and all these arrows meaning there are some sort of interaction between them. So by visualizing them, you can have a very interesting things going on, right? I mean, they are, they are not, they are not uh, paintings, they are not actually figurative illustrations or drawings. But then, when you, are, when you carefully read all these um, annotations, you can form a very visual story about this event. And, I've, and, I've feel, and, I've, and I think that's very fascinating, especially when all those data are actually public. And on the internet world, and I think that could be even going much further because we got so many, so much public data online. So another work I would like to show is by Josh On. The, the project is called They Root, and you can I think the, this website is still on. So it's a it's a website about um, the U.S. corporates, corporations. So on this, this is actually a tool for you to create maps between different companies. So in here, I try to uh, gather. Uh, Pepsi, the, the, the soda company, and also Coca-Cola. So I try to drag them in, onto the map. So this application is trying to tell you who are the board of directors of these companies. 
and their relationship. So immediately you can you can tell they are some, somewhat connected in some ways, and they are sort of connected to this pharmaceutical company by by making these kind of relationships using online and public data. We can use it to tell our own narratives, our own stories. Okay. And the second thing I want to talk about would be the social networks. It's very popular, especially in these years. And then um, I would like to refer to a uh, sociologist called Mark Renovator. He got a really interesting uh, idea about the strength of the weak ties. We got a lot of people around us, and some of them probably we will have a stronger relationship. Some of them got a weaker relationship. Uh, a lot of people will be very focused on the people who are having a stronger relationship with you because we hang out with them, we talk with them, and we just uh, we just uh, engage with them. But then, what he what he brought out is about the weak links. Somebody maybe you just uh, seen for a couple times. But they are very important because he, he, he thought that because that person like this guy having a very loose tie with me can can bring me into another larger network. And he's uh, I think he's a sociologist from the 60s, but then this is hardly proved, but until the age of the internet, then a boy, Jack Potter, also from our uh, research group do something called social network fragments, which is a visualization of the ties between you and your friends uh, based on email. So what we did is actually they visualize all your emails based on uh, the, the sending information, including uh, to, from, and also CC and BCC. Based on that, you create a galaxy of relationships. And then through that, you can sort of like look into it, and then if I expand it, you can see the wait times. And actually, that person could be identified, and then you know about, oh, that, that person might be useful because he can bring you to another, another group of people. And that kind of thing it would be very useful, especially for, um, for an organization if you want to manage a lot of people, if you want to identify who are the key or the, the, the key players in this sort of And then um, the third thing I want to talk about would be the online crowds. I think we all like to engage into some online conversation, but as I, as I said previously, how can we make sense of the, of, the, of the discussions by just a glance, just like what we are having uh, previously or what we are having in the offline world? How can we make sense of this conversation and make them a little bit more intuitive and a little bit more meaningful. So um, one of my research is about visualization of these conversations and the project is called Seascape and Volcano and the way that I'm, I I'm going to do that is about using motion. So I'm trying to use little animation loops to uh, to visualize the Usenet data. Usenet is actually an online uh, online conversations before uh, Web 2.0. And then, um, so I think I can just show you the demo of it. So through an interface, you can make a search of a particular keyword. So right now I just like uh, type in the word cat, and then it will give you a visualization of uh, two very huge uh, online conversations. So we can see like two different threads, two different groups. Each dot means one conversation, and by using animation or the movement, because we are very alert to this kind of movement, and then we, we can tell from the glance which particular conversation is more active. Like this, like in here, this group is very active, and the group on the top might be having more conversations, but they are kind of slow. That could mean they are not very active, and the messages are not very recent. So by that kind of methods, 
you can actually um, tell something, tell the social patterns of a particular online discussion group at a glance. So this is a view about visualizing the participants. So imagine all these dots represent a person in a group. So by their movements, we can tell whether they are uh, very actively engaged in a conversation or whether they are very quiet, just reading all the notes. So that could be visualized and I think that would be very helpful in, for people who would like to navigate into these threads or for people who are looking for uh, information on these conversations. Mm. So, uh, come to the second part of my presentation that is about recreate. Recreate means like how we can make use of our physical experiences, our face-to-face -face communication in specific. So, get back to social networking. So, I know a lot of people would like to use Facebook, so this is my Facebook page. I think most of people would like to concerned about like how big your social network is, or at least uh, for, the, for the creators of the social network, they would like you to have bigger networks so that they can have more people joining in, right? And then, or like how far you can get hold of some, somebody. It's like how far you can reach, can you reach, uh, can you make a network reach to the maybe the president of your country? I think if you can do that, it might be a good thing for a lot of people, but uh, my thinking would be about how genuine the relationship is. Because not a lot of um, social networks are based on um, how real that trust could be or how genuine that relationship could be. And then also about trust, like would that be trust on the internet? Would that, like, everybody could be having different identities on the internet and how are we going to mediate trust and, and the realness of your relationship. This is something that I'm, I'm very interested in. So I try to uh, get inspired, actually I get inspired from the relationship with my girlfriend. Uh, I get some sort of question about love and trust could roughly mean effort plus time and of course plus money. That could roughly translate into love and trust. I hope you guys wouldn't disagree. And then, um, that's why I created a platform called dvdb.com. And it's what I call an anti-social networking platform. It's not about um, not talking to people, not connecting to people, but it's more about uh, doing social networking in a, in a different way than, than what all other social networking sites are doing. So here are some previews of the stuff that happened on dvdb.com. I, I would just like, it is actually uh, a platform for designers and creators where you can create your own blogs. So you can build your own blogs on it, you can, you can socialize with people, but in a, I feel like in a more tighter and more close way. And then uh, I would like to introduce some special features on the site. So first of all, First of them is the, what I call user unfriendliness. So we always want the website to be very user friendly, but somehow if you make it a little bit more difficult to navigate or a little bit more difficult to be participate, that could mean like, I mean, if you do it, that would mean you are putting more effort into it because it's actually you need to overcome a lot of things in order to navigate to the site or activate certain functions. So. First thing that you uh, join DVDB is that you have to send in a uh, verification photo. And then that, on that photo, you need to show your face. You need to write a sign saying you love DVDB. I think that is the first step to create or to establish a relationship or a connection to the site as well as showing it to other members. So I just give you a uh, some background information about the site. Right now, the site got, uh, I think, 50,000 people, mainly in China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. And they are all creative-related target audiences. So, 
And people like to use it as a way to express themselves and to be more creative, like this. Or, I mean, my, my rule is that you, you cannot use Photoshop, you cannot use any digital applications to create this photo. It has to be real. And I will verify it um, individually each day. That's what one of my job will be actually going through all these photos when there's new member coming in. I can show you, uh, like, these are all different, uh, different versions of photos. Or, like, even greater effort will be somebody like that. That could mean a lot to the other members, right? <coughs> and all these photos are only visible to, to the member who are verified. Uh, another feature that I want to show you is about the clicks. We all know that one click is very, uh, very cheap, very minimal on the internet, right? Just very little. Effort. But what about I just keep on clicking it, clicking it like every day, every hour, and every year. That could mean quite a lot, right? So uh, actually, on our on my website, that there, there, there is one feature called Miss You. A miss you is about uh, if you want to miss somebody, you can click once, but you can only do it uh, one time each day. So if you see somebody clicking you for or missing you for 300 times, that means that person has been persistently clicking on that button for almost a year. That could mean quite a lot. So the whole idea is about how you can mediate all these offline experiences or offline communication models onto the digital world. Another, another feature is about uh, serendipity. So serendipity is also very important because uh, there are so many people online, there are so many people offline. How are we going to meet somebody would be very interesting. So there is a feature on on a site that facilitate that. That means like randomly you will be uh, match up with somebody else. Then because of the web, because of the nature of the website, everybody is like is quite open and quite real because you got to show your photo, you must post up all the stuff about you. People would, I think, people would uh, cherish that kind of casual encounter on the website. So so that the serendipity part becomes seen as a surprise. And also, uh, another topic that I want to cover is nonverbal communication and subtle nuances. So you can see, like, in the offline world, there are so many nonverbal communication. I think nonverbal communications are actually account for almost 40% of our communication models. It's not about the words that I said. It's about like how I look like, uh, how my hairdo is, or how what is my accent, and how I. How I'm dressing. I mean, all that information conveys some something to you about me and about the stuff that I am talking to you. So, like, like all these body languages, that all means something in the offline world. When you're talking to people, you are you're very aware of these kind of little tiny subtle nuances. But the problem is in the online world, a lot of them are lost, especially when you are like chatting with a friend, using SMS, using MSN, using all these kind of IM tool. We know that we love text, because text is very simple and direct. But the thing is, it's really hard to convey uh, verbal cues. So uh, another project that I did is called Chero. It's a, it's try, what, what I'm trying to do is try to convey emotions and try to embed them and incorporate them into text messages. So what I did is, uh, I tried to be the text, the alphabet. So in, a, in the beginning of research, what I did is I tried to be the alphabet and tried to be them. And, and what, I, what I did is basically I, I find a set of emotions. I think it's eight different set of emotions and try to express it through my body language, through the posture. And I try to get it into the alphabet and created this little interface that can help you convey your emotions in a more improper way. It's not about it's not about the emotions. Because so here here is an example of the emotions. 
so we can have because we can have cypher songs in our languages like like this one this one is kind of like shaking your head if you shake your head and you said you are happy it could mean different things than what you just conveyed right and like this like oh so sad and so relaxed when it matches with your body language it can actually emphasize and make it a little bit stronger so we, we all know about it and I, I would like to differentiate this work with modicons because modicons comes as just like an alphabet because it's kind of dis uh, disjoint with the real conversation what I want to achieve is try to merge them seamlessly and then I did a uh, research about uh, mouse gestures so you know that uh, we would like to do gestures to, to, to convey our message but in the online world or using a mouse that might happen the same way so in here I tried to do an extensive research about mouse gestures and I tried to find out something like maybe an upward stroke in here it means you are kind of aroused or happy uh, kind of like a horizontal stroke it means you are relaxed I mean, or maybe a heart shape it means you are engaged in some sort of romantic relationship. So that kind of thing, I try to map that into this interface so that people can actually use mouse to convey, uh, to convey more than just the text. I can, so this is how it looks like. Uh, I'm just going, going to show you an example. So here, what I did is I just type a text and then I try to make an upward stroke. So just kind of like giving you a little bit of um, emotions out of the text. And then, um, what if I make a downward stroke? It means that like you are a little bit sad or relaxed. So it's, I feel like it's totally different and it could be quite interesting when you look at the text in this kind of way. Or another example is that if you want to make a ironic statement, Say, say I'm fine, but you are giving a very sad emotion. So it means I'm fine, or in some sort of intonation could be introduced into that in a very simple way. All right. Um, the third thing is about uh, integration. So integration means. Um, combining online and offline seamlessly, intuitively, how can we just merge them together? The first thing is about visualize purely online. Second thing is about uh, getting some experiences from the offline. Third thing would be try to combine them together, but not very like, not, not very forcefully, but very seamlessly and intuitively. And so in here, what I want to tell you is we are trying to get the pixel out of the computer screen, out of the virtual world. How can we do it? Uh, I just want to show you one of my uh, favorite pieces by Nestle Jeremy Junko. It's a very simple interactive installation. It is a, it's actually just a dangling wire. Uh, hanging from the ceiling and it's actually mapped to the network traffic so it's when it moves that means there are network traffic so when people are sending emails it will move when a lot of people are sending emails they will move very vigorously so as simple as that but through this kind of installation you can kind of like get in a lot of like a lot of offline or Line, virtual information into the offline because we would like to see things in real, we would like to see physical things, we would like to touch, we would like to listen to all this mechanical sound that make us feel exist. Uh, another example by Kelly Dobson is a work called Blendy. This is also a very interesting example of how you can connect or a very awkward way of connecting with uh, technologies.
I think there are some problems with the sound, but I think you guys all get it, right? You make software that can communicate with the blender. That's pretty brilliant. And then uh, another example would be uh, a work by Hiroshi Ishii. He's also he's leading the Tangible Media Group at the Media Lab. So one of his great, greatest work would be called uh, it's called Music Bottles. It's also uh, a very simple idea. So there are three different bottles. And then when you put it, put it on to the system. It seems that I have been walking for hours. I've been following tracks and more tracks. They go in all so directions. So this is like, no sense. You try to Even worse, some, the trees are sort of thick around me. Sound, 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 I can hardly see the sun. These are truly great ancient forests. Right, open it to bars. It is a very so it's it's here it's here simple and direct metaphor to the physical world. I don't even know what I have, but I know that I have to. If I don't, my father will look at me sadly. He will shake his head and will think he's weak. So I must prove myself here. I wish to I wish to see my entire Suddenly the trees open up. I step into a clearing and see the earth is sky far above. A single beetle drift from the blue. He will need to go up. Today will be a success. I look down at the ground and see more tracks. I choose one set and I follow them back into the undergrowth. And then another way to incorporate both worlds, like online and offline, would be augmenting our senses. So this is how we can uh, make use of digital technologies to help us to get more things on the physical world. Just like, you can, well, what if you can control some other entities? Uh, this is a project that I was also involved at the social media group. It's, it's called Agorophone. It is a piece of um, interactive sculpture that's standing at our campus. So basically it is a, it's a sticker, but how can you get, how can you broadcast your sound would be calling in to this speaker. So if this speaker got a phone number where everybody can call into, but then uh, when you are broadcasting your sound, it's very quiet, so that it attracts people to come and listen to you. And then a lot of people we find out is actually hiding behind the woods and then looking for uh, people's reaction. And actually, people can talk whatever things they want because there are certain uh, level of anonymity. People are anonymous, and some people could be calling from the other country. Some people could be calling from just right behind it. So that creates a different way of communication. So we know that um, it's like once the, since the invention of telephone, we we got so many models of communication. And by 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 uh, the invention of internet, that's even further. I think uh, like Twitter, like Foursquare, all sorts of things is actually helping you to communicate. And then I think we would like to engage in different forms of communications with different people or with different purposes. Some of them could be public, some of them could be private. So it's about how we can make use of this communication and try to achieve what we want. This is like how people are interacting with it. And um, another project that I want to show is called Goldfish Music Box. This is a piece that I did, I think, two years ago. I just recently um, put it onto the iPhone. It is a little app that can translate or convert movement and color into music. So when the app opens, it will just uh, use the, the iPhone's camera. And it tracks color and movement try to convert it into sound. And through this interface, you can map different color into different instruments. So like in this example, I, I map the black color into bass and the red color into uh, the strings. So that when things 
on moving, they can produce different musical tones. So I think this is, I feel like this is very interesting because right now I, I can listen to uh, the world, to the city. I think a lot of my friends are telling me they, they, they are inventing different ways of using it. It's not just like for the goldfish, it could be for the clouds, it could be for, for the city, when you are uh, when you are having a ride on a taxi, you can point it out to the windows and then you can listen to the city. So I think that kind of things could help you to uh, create or invent your own experiences through this little app. Uh, I think another example that I want to show you is called uh, Sekai Camera. This app is, uh, I think this app is very functional. It's about recording or um, try to tag places with your own messages. So, and by using the camera, the user can see an extra layer of uh, the stories and all these nuances and conversations about the city. I feel like this, this one is, could be also very interesting and it could open up a whole new space of sharing information and also communication. I think you can, if you got an iPhone, you can try to download it, it's free, I think it's very useful. So, uh, to summarize what I want to say is to visualize, to recreate, and then to integrate. So by that, hopefully to give you some sort of insights to the, the digital world and also technologies. And last but not least, I would like to tell you, love and trust give me an effort, time, and money. That would be a useful way of uh, starting a social network. And then, I think most important would be our feelings and needs. It's not about the technology, because the technology should be invisible, right? It should be just help you to sense the world, to, to perceive what's happening around you. I think that's the end of the presentation. Thank you.